from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour, just days away from Jeff Bezos launching into space. Whatever happens, it will be a milestone for the space race, but the future of space is much bigger than Bezos or Branson, and we'll tell you how. Plus, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella told us the rash of cyber attacks is the new pandemic. Just how dangerous is the threat? And could following the trail of crypto be the key to stopping it? We'll ask CrowdStrike's CEO, George Kurtz. And Apple is getting in on the buy now, pay later trend, competing with incumbents like PayPal and Affirm. Affirm CEO Max Levchin will tell us how he thinks the competition stacks up. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with our own Kriti Gupta. Kriti, how did we end the week? Well, Emily, the first weekly loss after three weeks of gains, and today really kind of capped that. You started to see a risk-off day in the markets when it came to, this, to uh, the stock market, of course. The S&P 500 down. Uh, three quarters of a percent and big tech really taking the hit dragging the index down as a whole and where did that money go Emily straight into treasuries even uh, yields coming in flat on the day but they ended up much they started the day much higher ended up flat so it really tells you that bid for treasuries is alive and strong but I want to show you where all the action is it's in those semiconductor stocks take a look at this this is the uh, kind of two-year chart here you do have this really big acceleration of course this is the market crash of last year but then you do have this acceleration from the global chip shortage showing up in the stocks index. But if you actually started to look at the right side of that chart, a little bit of stagnation. Today in particular was crucial, though, because, of course, you did have news coming out from Intel in particular, news from the Wall Street Journal that it could potentially look to acquire Global Foundries, a $30 billion company that may actually help it increase its global capacity. So in a five-day chart, you started to see Intel slide, a slight pickup today at the start of the trading session, and then another slide, Emily. Let's see, though, going into earnings next week, whether that stays put. All right, we'll be all over that. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, thanks so much. All right, e-commerce entrepreneur Mark Lorre enforcing his no-tie policy at his apartment on the receiving end. MLB all-star Alex Rodriguez, otherwise known as A-Rod. There you see it. The pair has joined forces to create venture capital firm VCP, where they'll be focusing on early stage funding and taking what they say is a more personalized approach to their companies. Rodriguez and Lori sat down with my colleagues Alex Steele and Guy Johnson for their first broadcast interview together. It's really about VCP, so finding entrepreneurs that uh, you know, have all the traits that we look for in great entrepreneurs. We call it spotic, smart, passionate, optimistic, tenacious, adaptable, kind, and empathetic. So find entrepreneurs that they exhibit those traits, that have a big vision, um, where we think that capital could, could uh, it requires a lot of capital and creates a moat around the business and where you know, execution is key and, and people really make the difference. And so we'll help the founder you know, with the vision, uh, raise the capital, and then help them hire the very best people. And, and nobody's better than Alex at, at helping convince uh, people to come join these, these startups. Uh, Alex has done a, an amazing job of, of helping recruit into these companies. Yeah, and Guy, to add to that, I think, thank you, to, to the fact is, this is the first time in probably in decades that Mark and I can actually convince or beat out a big institution because we found that founders actually want the personal relationship, they want the experience, they see what Mark has done over the last 25 years with diapers, with Jet, with Walmart, they've seen what I've done in my baseball career and now as a business. They know they can pick up the phone, they know Mark and I are gonna make decisions really quickly, yes or no, and young founders, the ability to move very fast mm -hmm. is, is vital. Do, do you feel like there's a lot of competition or have you moved down enough to the scale or you have the smaller supersede companies that you can really find better opportunities. Yeah, it's great for us that there's all this competition in later rounds because mm. uh, we're coming really early, right at the beginning, pre-seed, when there's really nothing but an idea. And so most of those funds, in fact, I think all those funds aren't really playing uh, that early. So we come in with 10, 50 million, and now we're ready for a really big Series B round, hundreds of millions, if mm. not a billion. Yep. I think Archer was a great example, uh, the EV tall flying car company that we did, where we came in you know, two years ago with 5 million, 50 million, 
and then uh, they went out and raised a billion dollar SPAC. And that's kind of a very uh, good example of how VCP works. In two years, you go from nothing to a, a three, three plus billion dollar market cap. How we watch sports is completely different. And like the different streaming services and, and, and where the profitability is gonna be. So Alex, I'm particularly interested in how you're thinking about media and sports mm -hmm. and how you get ahead of the, ch the changes so you can really get ahead of it, make some money. Yeah, I think all commissioners are thinking the same thing. Number one, they have to figure out a way how to get direct to consumer. And they understand that nobody's gonna do it for them. So that's number one. Number two, uh, particularly in baseball, which is what I cover with, with Fox and ESPN, is access, access, access. I think we ju I just covered the All-Star game and we had a remarkable uh, viewership, but what was really special about it, you had players talking in real time at the batter's box when they were playing shortstop, the pitchers on the mound, and baseball specifically has such an opportunity to uncover and unveil what great personalities. People just want to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I used to talk to Derek Jeter or Mariano Rivera, I would always have fans ask me after the game, well, what you guys talk about? Like, <laughs> we all want to be a part of it. And the more inclusive we can become is going to be a massive opportunity for baseball. What did you talk about? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I, I also think there's an incredible opportunity to infuse technology more in the sport, uh, especially <clears throat> augmented reality. I think you talked about entertainment and sports and being able to sort of view the game in a completely different way. Mm. Um, I think that's, that's something that we'll definitely see in the future. And one more thing, Alex and Guy, I think when you think about what's happened outside of these buildings and stadiums, you have Uber, you have Airbnb, all those things have happened outside. Mark and I have ideas of what can happen inside to make it more efficient and to make it more fan friendly for the, fan, for the fans. How, you talk about inside the stadium. Yeah. How much, like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I think there's uh, opportunities. I'll let Mark talk a little bit about it as well. I think technology with ticketing, there's opportunities where you can make it really dynamic. Right now you have dynamic uh, ticketing for the season, in season for season tickets. I think there's an opportunity in game to be able to do some dynamic stuff to bring not only great revenue to the teams, but even a customer experience can be improved by a lot. Yeah, exactly. I think we could really personalize the experience. Um, I think personalized announcing is super interesting. The idea that if you're a little kid, maybe SpongeBob is announcing the game, that sort of thing. Like, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you make it more entertaining and, and really cater and personalize the experience? Hmm. Over here, we're having all kinds of problems with COVID and sport. And it seems to be ripping through sports teams at a ferocious rate. The Yankees are having the same problem right now. Do you think, how do we deal with this? Do you think the league should mandate that, that everybody on the team, everybody on the coaching staff, everybody around them should get a vaccine? Do you think that's the point we're getting to? Because at the moment, I, fans, are, I, fans I, there's games getting cancelled. It's really frustrating. Do you think there's more the league should be doing? Um, I, I would just say this. I, I think that is a very fluid time. I think when in doubt, you lean on the science. Uh, that's obviously out of my pay grade. But I do think that we have to figure out ways to, to move forward uh, and yet keep everybody safe. But it's a very uh, unfortunate situation that's happening, not only where you're at, Guy, but here in the States and, and everywhere around the world. New VCP partners, Mark Laurie and A-Rod. All right, well, first it was fake beef. Now, Impossible Foods plans, plans to debut a plant-based chicken nugget this fall. The company is expected to unveil the product at a trade show next week. It uses textured soy protein and sunflower to replicate the taste of nuggets. Impossible's rival Beyond Meat began selling its plant-based chicken tender last week. Coming up, we're counting down to a second billionaire heading into space. We will have the latest on the preparations for the Blue Origin liftoff next. This is Bloomberg. We are now T minus four days until a second billionaire attempts to make his way into space. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos is due to blast off aboard one of his Blue Origin rockets Tuesday. He will be accompanied by his brother, along with the youngest and oldest person to fly into space, should all go to plan. In this week's Bloomberg Business Week, our Ashley Vance takes a look at the current space race and says the orbital economy goes far beyond the dreams of billionaire spacemen. Ashley is with us now. So, Ashley, you've been to your share of space launches. You wrote a book about Elon Musk. Branson made it safely. Bezos is about to do this. From what you know about Blue Origin, how likely is it that Tuesday will come off without a hitch? 
I, you know, the Blue Origin flight looks kind of safer, really, than the the Virgin Galactic one did, just because Blue has done. I think they've done about a dozen tests with these these mannequins and and uh, taken the spaceship up and brought it back down safely. And yeah, so you know, I mean, things you know, God willing, should go well. So when you say that the future of space is bigger than Bezos, talk to us about what you mean. What does this future ecosystem look like? Well, you know, over the last week or two weeks when everyone's been kind of consumed with this mania around these these launches, I just felt like people were missing the point of what's going on. There's been a lot of kind of pro and a, a lot of con takes against billionaires going to space in this moment. We've got other things to worry about. Um, what I try to argue in the story that I wrote this week is that, that this, these space tourism is just one small part of a booming private space economy. Um, we've got tons of rockets now. We've got tens of thousands of satellites that are about to go up. We're kind of building a computing shell around the earth and you know so whether you like what these two guys are doing this week or not you know i i think private space really is here to stay so say bezos has a successful launch what's next well for them you know i mean they they for Virgin Galactic, it's very clear they want to continue to do space tourism, and that that's a major that's the major business for them. For Jeff, it's a, it's a little unclear if they're going to really pursue the space tourism with full force or or focus more on more kind of what SpaceX does today, which is carrying satellites into orbit and potentially people to the International Space Station. Blue Origin has a couple of rocket families, and and it looks like Jeff was more interested in more of this industrial um, type stuff. I think either way, we are in a new era. If this goes successfully, um, space tourism is real. I think it'll go from super wealthy people to wealthy people being able to do this. And then one day, hopefully, kind of anyone who wants to do it could do it. You make you make the point in your piece, which I think is kind of lost, uh, maybe lost in this, this whole conversation, is that you know, we're not going to be dependent on the government to get to space. I mean, these folks, uh, at least for now, they can go anytime they want. So take us out 10 years from now, 2030. What does the space ecosystem look like? I think it's going to be pretty exciting and unpredictable. I, I feel like people have missed what, what's happened the last even just five years. SpaceX has been so successful. You've got this company, Rocket Lab, down in New Zealand, which is a private rocket company. Um, they've done dozens of launches. We've got people wanting to put up these tens of thousands of satellites. None of this, you know, there are government approvals that go into this, but these companies are moving so much faster than governments ever did that it, it sort of has this like Wild West feeling to it. And so, you know, you want to be careful. We don't want to flood um, low Earth orbit with more junk and things like that. But I think it's an exciting time. I mean, to me, it feels a little like the early days of the consumer internet is kind of like, we're not exactly sure what people are going to build up there. But it, it feels like it has this potential to be, you know, like a whole new economy that's being put in place. Now, I know it's not about a competition, but let's talk about the competition. What do you imagine <laughs> Elon Musk is thinking right now? I mean, I know we saw it looked like Elon Musk was in New Mexico with Branson, wishing him well. Why hasn't he done this yet? I mean, I know he said he wants to die on Mars and not on impact. But, um, you know, why do you think he's waiting in the wings here? I think, mean, well, so Elon's definitely team uh, Branson and not team Bezos. <laughs> and I think it's funny. I mean, SpaceX was just never meant to be about space tourism. The only, they are doing some things now, like a mission around the moon and sending Tom Cruise to the ISS. But I think that's just because it's easy money that they can make. It, you know, for Elon, it's always been this way more industrial we're getting to Mars, we're gonna to make tons of rockets that can do that. And so the appeal of like a short trip, a few minutes in suborbit, I, I just don't think is, is that intriguing to him. I do think one day um, in a few years, I, I could definitely imagine him doing a couple laps around the moon, but but you know, I just, I just don't think this floats his boat right now. All right, well, maybe he was the one that bought that $28 million ticket and then gave it up <laughs> due to scheduling conflicts. You never know. We're trying to find out who that is. Um, our very own Ashley Vance, you can check out that piece in Bloomberg Business Week. It is an excellent read, um, so definitely check it out.
we are going to bring you live special coverage of Jeff Bezos and his Blue Origin flight to space next Tuesday starting 8.30 a.m. Wall Street time, 5.30 a.m. here on the West Coast. I'll be there on the ground. Cannot wait. Coming up, Apple is pushing into the buy now, pay later business that rivals a firm and PayPal have been dominating for some time. We're going to talk to a firm CEO, Max Levchin, about potential competition with the iPhone maker next. And let's take a look at how Apple ended the week down almost one and a half percent Friday. The iPhone maker has been surpassed by China's Xiaomi, which has now become the world's second biggest smartphone maker. This according to preliminary estimates from Canalys. The firm saying Xiaomi increased its shipments by 83% over the last quarter. Samsung had a 19% market share in the second quarter, followed by Xiaomi and then Apple at 14%. This is Bloomberg. news we're watching the Indian digital payments pioneer Paytm is seeking approval for a 2.2 billion dollar IPO which could be the country's largest Paytm is backed by SoftBank Berkshire Hathaway and Ant Group it hopes to capitalize on the rising popularity of internet based consumer companies well earlier this week Bloomberg reported that Apple is working on a new service that'll let consumers pay for any Apple pay purchase in installments over time this would rival the buy now pay later offerings popularized by companies like Affirm and PayPal. Apple will use Goldman Sachs as the lender for the installment offerings. How will it stack up to the competition? Well, let's bring in some of the quote unquote competition Affirm CEO Max Levchin. So Max, taking a look at what we know so far, what do you think Affirm has over what Apple plans to offer? Uh, so from what I know, at least, uh, neither Goldman nor Apple have said anything about their collaboration uh, to be. So I, I can't really uh, compare. Uh, I can tell you exactly what a firm is because I, I think it really matters to understand the difference. We are not a wallet, which is what I think a lot of the competition or would be competition is. We're in the business of turning browsers into buyers, which is fundamentally a merchant service. If you look at the merchants that we have, you know, we have from Target to Walmart, from New Markets to Williams and Oma, so the network is vast at this point. Um, we are in the business of bringing them new customers, increasing the cart size, increasing conversion at the point of sale, basically enabling our merchants to grow without discounting. And that is a very complex set of technology and partnerships that are very deep and exist at from, from the front page to the product details page to the checkout. So that is a significant amount of stuff that we have built and have specialized in and have become a, a leader in. So I think we, we're in a somewhat different business um, than just about anybody else. And we've been very, very strong and have built uh, quite a moat in, in the last 10 years. You certainly have many existing merchant deals that Apple doesn't have yet, but given that Apple service will likely, as we understand it, integrate very seamlessly into the iPhone, just like Apple Pay does today. What advantage does a firm have then? And does that concern you? So it is both about reach, which, you know, obviously Apple is a giant company. They have an incredible number of customers, but it's also about underwriting and depth of understanding of your customer. The, the thing that we've learned in the last 10 years isn't just how to get very large. Obviously, we cover the world's largest retailer and many, many partners, Shopify, we power Shopify installments, which is a gargantuan ecosystem of consumers and merchants. So we also have scale, uh, and you know, I'd like to believe we integrate very, very seamlessly at this point. The one thing that we do have that no one does is we have a decade of underwriting consumers through good times, through the COVID shock, through the you know, post OE recovery. And that kind of learning you can't speed up. It is only doable through time. You have to lend money and watch consumers pay you back and learn how to underwrite people that are not in any system. Young consumers that opted out of the credit card world, people who are not in credit bureau data sets. And so that is something that is unique to us. And uh, I don't think you can just sort of turn that on and, and compete with. And so in that sense, I think we have enormous advantage. And frankly, that's how we've beaten back the competitors from the traditional banking world time and time again, every time we are pitted against 
a traditional bank, it turns out that we are just much better at underwriting and have a significantly better understanding of the consumer. Now, obviously it's a big enough market and you identified it years ago, a big enough market that Apple wants to chase it too. How much growth do you see in the buy now, pay later market? And is it all a good thing if consumers are taking on more debt in this way? Uh, obviously, you know that uh, our mission is super important to us. We're fundamentally built around this notion of responsible spending, responsible borrowing. We don't charge any kind of fees, not even late fees, specifically to fully align ourselves with the consumer. And so I think creating opportunities for consumers to buy that makes them feel safe and smart and responsible is a good thing. Pushing them to overspend is a bad thing. And we are very, very directional on both those fronts. And so there's a tremendous amount of growth. If um, I think last time I looked, uh, there's only maybe two or 3% of the US uh, overall spending is, uh, is in buy now, pay later, depending on sort of what you consider the denominator, but there's an incredible amount of growth and the demand for this kind of product, especially among Gen X, Gen Z, millennial is seemingly unstoppable. So it's no surprise that the competition is, uh, is, is, is vast, but I do think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot to do to bring the education and the responsibility front and center to the end consumer just as convenience and uh, access to capital, access to, to credit uh, should be there as well. Okay, now you told me earlier this year that you thought consumer spending would be booming this summer, like every weekend would be like Thanksgiving weekend. We have just about a minute left. Quickly, what spending patterns are you actually I, 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 How I much are they buying? You, what are they buying? I thought you'd like, you'd like <laughs> some, uh, some stats, so this time I came prepared. So, so July 4th, this is actually a great uh, sample. So I, I looked at our numbers. Um, so typically September and October are peak ticketing months. Travel loan volume for us, July 4th weekend was almost 500%, 450% year on year growth. Spending on home rentals, hotels up 250% year on year. People are basically running out of their lockdowns and going to travel, staying in rentals, going to hotels. Um, Apparel is up 90% year on year for the July 4th weekend. Jewelry is up 60% year on year. So all of these metrics are essentially people are trying to look good. People are trying to travel. People are trying to get out of town. They've been really sick and tired of lockdown. So I stand by the claim that uh, Thanksgiving in July and, uh, and continue. Okay. Max Levchin, CEO of Affirm. Always good to have you. Thanks for coming prepared. Appreciate it. Um, coming up, President Biden is looking to crack down on the surge in ransomware attacks and crypto scams. CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz with us next to talk about it all. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get another look at the markets with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. Kriti, take it away. Well, Emily, at the top of the show, we were talking about Intel, but I just want to start macro there before we dive into some more of the specifics of that deal. The Sox Index, a one-year chart, global chip shortage has those shares just rallying, but now it kind of looks like it's running out of steam, stagnating for the last couple of months. So this is kind of the macro picture that you're seeing. So when Intel announced or actually was reported that it was looking into Global Foundries, a $30 billion company that could increase its global capacity by 50%, these are the numbers that investors wanted to look at. Intel compared to some of their competitors, Global Foundries at the beginning of them. I mean, check a look at those gross margin numbers because going into earnings season, that's going to be at the top of the stack. 57% versus 30% for Global Foundries. Going into earnings season, you really want to see, can Intel really keep up with these numbers, how much will a Global Foundry's acquisition really help their bottom line, especially given how they've performed with some of their other companies. If you just look at a chart that really points out their performance compared to Apple, compared to uh, NVIDIA, compared to AMD, you can really see that Intel, this white line at the bottom, it's been lagging and it's been lagging for a while. They really do need to up their manufacturing capacity and that's why this deal was so important, Emily. Let's see if it actually comes, th comes through, excuse me. All right, Kriti, thanks so much for the roundup. Have a great week.
Facebook critics, meantime, say they have had enough and are heading to Washington in their battle to force tech companies to better regulate hate speech on their platforms. Organizations like Color of Change, the Anti-Defamation League, Common Sense Media are hoping to use the Democratic-controlled White House to exert some real change. Joining me now, Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton. Anna, there's, there's so much going on when it comes to tech antitrust scrutiny and Facebook in particular. Talk to us about the latest developments. Yeah, so some of the complaints that we heard from the civil rights groups that we spoke with for this article are, you know, things that have been going on for decades. You know, they're worried about micro-targeted advertising that discriminates against certain communities, be it women or people of color. They're worried about some of the hate speech and white supremacy that we see kind of prolif proliferating on these sites, despite the the efforts of the companies to take down this kind of content. And, you know, they've been begging companies like Facebook to change, in some cases, for decades, you know, talking to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg in some cases. But the company just hasn't changed. And so now they're taking their complaints to Washington to try to convince Democratic lawmakers to force the companies to change through legislation. So is that going to work? And what is Congress going to do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Legislating is a slow process, and these are really tricky policy questions to get right for a few reasons, not least of all the First Amendment, which really kind of restricts what the government can do in terms of speech for a private company. There are a few bills that are out there. One of them would look at algorithms rather than content, so kind of requiring companies to be held responsible for the way they spread content, not necessarily for the original posting of the content. But these bills have a long road ahead of them before they could actually become law. You know, Democrats do have both chambers, but by a very slim majority. And even if the Democratic House could pass something with a simple majority, it would need at least 10 Senate Republicans in, in the Senate, which is a very tough sell when it comes to this kind of measure. So what does this problem look like long term? What does it mean for Facebook? Yeah, you know, one thing that we hear from, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg whenever he comes to testify in Congress is that he wants Facebook to be a good experience for people and that he, you know, wants people to come away from Facebook with a positive experience. But, you know, a lot of Facebook users are generating and sharing this offensive content or, you know, in some way, in some instances, you know, planning or <laughs> inciting violence on the, on the website. So, you know, it's hard to see what this means for Facebook's future, you know, if this is a place that people increasingly associate with some of the more extreme elements of society, it's going to become a place that people don't want to spend time and that, you know, people look elsewhere for their connections, be it other social media sites or, you know, new technology to come up that, that we don't even know about yet. All right, Anna Edgerton, thanks for continuing to uh, keep us updated on the developments in Washington. Thanks so much for that update. All right, Samsung Electronics is considering a second location in Texas for its $17 billion U.S. semiconductor plant. It's exploring another 6 million square foot site in addition to an already disclosed expansion of its Austin facility. The project could address U.S. concerns about chip security, onshoring production, while helping the South Korean company win more U.S. clients. Coming up, what a week for Netflix, a ton of Emmy nominations, plus reports it is planning to move into gaming. We'll talk about it all, plus look ahead to next week's earnings after the break. This is Bloomberg. administration is ramping up efforts to disrupt ransomware operations and this time they are zeroing in on crypto. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin have been the favored payment method for hackers with victims paying more than $400 million in crypto in 2020. The White House wants more rigorous crypto tracing and will offer a $10 million reward for information that leads to the arrest of ransomware gangs. Joining us now to discuss the intersection of cyber and crypto, CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz. George, great to have you back with us. So how has crypto sort of changed the cyber threat landscape and the ability for these attackers to extort money anonymously? 
Well, I think it's really enabled it. You know, when you look at Bitcoin and how it evolved and how it was being used in the early days, a lot of it was, uh, you know, uh, dark web and and uh, back alleys of the internet. Uh, certainly now it's become commonplace for people to have it in their portfolio, uh, but it does allow a level of uh, an anonymous factor that allows people to actually get away with these sort of attacks and um, not be caught. So on the other hand, especially in the case of Colonial Pipeline, authorities were able to trace the path of that crypto to get that money returned. So I wonder, could crypto, and this being the modus operandi, also be a way um, to bring more of these folks to justice? Well, perhaps, but um, there's some really interesting services out there. One of them is a mixing service. There's, there's multiple ones um, that actually allow the, the crypto to be washed together with other crypto to make it even harder. So in some cases, you can track this down. In other cases, uh, the bad guys have found very creative ways to be able to essentially wash and launder uh, crypto so that it becomes even more anonymous. And I, I don't think just by outlawing crypto or clamping down on crypto is, is the single answer because the, the bad guys are always going to find some way to get paid. But certainly knowing your customer when you're dealing with crypto uh, can be helpful in trying to at least understand the trail of where that money is going. Now, earlier this week, I spoke to Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, and he described cyber attacks, the cyber threat landscape, as a new pandemic. Take a listen to what he had to say. Somebody described this to me, like, while we have a pandemic, we have another uh, real pandemic, which is a cyber. Uh, and that's going to be there uh, with us. Uh, so, but the, at the same time, I think what is really now much more, I think, in the consciousness uh, of people is, the level of attacks for sure have increased, but the need for our response uh, to be top notch has also increased. Would you echo that description? The threat landscape is a new pandemic? Um, I, it certainly has uh, become a pandemic. And over the last you know, four or five years, it's gotten worse and worse, both in the nation state level as well as uh, cybercrime. And what we've seen is the cyber criminals actually take a lot of the techniques from the nation state actors and actually apply that to cyber crime. And you have to look at it from the perspective of these threat actors, which is what CrowdStrike does. The nation state actors are focused on getting in, staying in, and basically being very silent. They don't want to get caught. From an e-crime actor, just by their very nature, if they're encrypting all of this data, they have to expose themselves, right? So we're seeing a lot more of it because of the e-crime element. But at the end of the day, um, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. At CrowdStrike, we're dealing with you know, much more than what you see in the headlines. And you know, we've seen uh, the ransomware and big game hunting dramatically escalate over the last two years. That's instead of one-off encryption of machines, it's get into a company, look like a nation state, encrypt all their machines, and then ask for massive ransoms. Now, let's talk also about the identity protection piece here, because, you know, we talk so much about um, the malware, the, the damage that's done, um, but there's, there's, so, there's so much, the extent of that damage is huge. And um, identities are at risk. You know, talk to us about the threat there and how CrowdStrike helps to combat that. Well, yeah, and it really comes down to zero trust. And when we, we think about these attacks, certainly there's malware that is being used every day. There's, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, probably over a million pieces of malware created a day at this point. Uh, obviously, it's problematic. And those are things that we, we stop automatically with our Falcon technology. But also, zero trust is really important. So is it really George who's logged into her computer? Was it Emily who's logged in? Where do you want to go on that network? And how can you trust that system? And that's one of the things that we've really pioneered on the endpoint is, is zero trust, being able to identify using AI whether that user is in fact, you know, George or Emily, and being able to prevent these lateral movements, which we've seen in every attack. And when we think about going to the cloud, we, we saw this with the, uh, the, 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 the sunburst activity and the hacks, is the directory services are vulnerable both on-premise and in the cloud. And we've seen a lot of attacks in those areas as well. So something that has to be locked down, and we're happy that we're pioneering the charge there. 
Now, something else interesting happened this week in that Revol, which is the cybercrime group that we believe was behind the JBS hack, Russia-based group or a group with ties to Russia, seems to have disappeared. This, of course, after President Biden's uh, sit-down with President Putin. Now, President Putin um, doesn't exactly do everything that the U.S. wants him to. What do you think actually happened in this case? Well, as a couple of scenarios, really, uh, you know, maybe they were taken out offensively uh, by the U.S. government. Don't know. That has, hasn't been announced. Uh, maybe they were asked uh, by the Russian government, uh, you know, asked, I say in quotes, uh, to stop their services. Or many times they just shut things down and reconstitute themselves because essentially the heat is on. And if we think about a lot of e-crime, just think about the physical world. You have a lot of businesses that are criminal uh, in nature. They just shut down, bankrupt themselves, and move on and just reconstitute themselves with a new name. And this, this group actually uh, was a group that did that. They shut down a couple of years ago uh, in their old name, and they reconstituted themselves as our evil. So it's quite likely they will come back. And even if they don't, there will be uh, many other e-crime actors to take their place. Now, when you look at the second half of the year, what are the key trends do you expect to see? Will we see as many ransomware attacks as we saw in the first half or more? I think more. Uh, you know, we, we see 200, 300,000 new samples of, of ransomware uh, literally every month. And um, these are very targeted in nature in, in many cases. And, you know, there's ransomware as a service, which Basically, if you're an e-crime actor, you may not even have the skills to create this ransomware. You can just buy it as a service. And in the case with our evil, you would actually pay them a cut. So um, given the business models, given how uh, low probability it is to actually get caught, it really is a big business with a lot of return. And uh, we have not seen it subside. We've only seen it increase, which is why it's so important to protect those endpoints and workloads uh, in the cloud. Okay, so just to clarify, I was told it was Revil. Is it Revil or is it our evil? Well, you can say it either way. I, we'd have to ask those guys. But if you look at uh, it, <laughs> the R is the ransomware, you know, ransomware evil. Um, so you can call it Revil, ransomware. I think what I call it is really nasty stuff by some bad people. And, uh, you know, we're focused on helping customers protect against it, which we've done. I'll check in with my Revil or our evil sources, George, and I'll report back to you. Thank you. Thank you. So much good for joining you. us. CrowdStrike CEO, George Kurtz. Always good to have you. All right, tech earnings kicking off next week. Netflix set to release its quarterly report Tuesday, and it has been quite a week for the streaming giant. Netflix receiving 129 Emmy nominations just behind HBO and HBO Max. We also learned that Netflix is planning to offer video games. Our very own Lucas Shaw was behind that Bloomberg scoop and joins us now. So Lucas, curious what the reverberations have been through the entertainment industry about Netflix's foray into gaming. You know, I think a lot of people are confused, if you will, as to what exactly the plans are. It seemed mixed reaction among investors on Wall Street, mixed reaction in town. At the same time, it, it feels a little bit inevitable because the leadership of the company has been signaling it for a while. And the, the big question is whether Netflix is going to be more successful than other entertainment companies that have tried this. You know, none other than Disney has tried to make video games before and it didn't go so well. Um, it's, you know, is it a natural extension of the storytelling that Netflix already does, which is what the company thinks, or is it a whole new medium that they have to figure out? That was my question, you know, with Disney and so many well-known characters that we've all sort of come to love over decades, why couldn't Disney pull it off? And, you know, why would Netflix then be any different? You know... It's a good question on Disney. I'm not sure I know the answer other than every every effort that they've made over the past several years it has not gone well, and it's been much easier for them to license those characters to other people. You know, Star Wars games that, that other companies make are, are certainly very popular. Um, Netflix, and, and I think that also gets at one of the big challenges for, for Netflix and one that people don't know the answer to is which characters, what shows are they going to make that are going to work as video games? You know, other than Stranger Things, which there are already a couple of mobile games of, um, you know, are there big shows that they own? Because remember, a lot of Netflix shows are actually owned by other studios, or at least to which they have the rights, that they can turn into games. And it's, it's a little too early to know because the company hasn't announced any plans. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw them take some anime titles and try to make a game out of it. 
Uh, there's been some speculation about a Bridgerton game. I suppose that's possible, uh, although I see Bridgerton as, as more likely to be kind of clothing lines and experiences than video games. Interesting. Yeah, it uh, feels like a different audience, but you never know. Um, so talk to us about the Emmys. You know, every, every, every year the, the nominations shake up Hollywood, sort of re, you know, have, get people talking about the new hierarchy. What's your big takeaway from the nods this year? Um, you know, the, the obvious one is streaming just dominated everything. I mean, uh, you know, HBO slash HBO Max and Netflix had far and away the most. Disney Plus is second. Uh, you know, Apple TV had more than I think some of the broadcast networks. Uh, it, it's just it's, the streaming services completely dominated. But I think also that that a lot of those streaming services have become sort of more more commercial, more broad, more broad appealing. You know, there was a time in the transition from broadcast TV to cable and streaming where a lot of the shows that got nominated for these awards tended to be pretty niche. You know, you think about a show like Mad Men that did really well at the Emmys, but only a couple million people watched that show. Now you have shows like The Mandalorian getting tied for the most nominations, and that's a big, broad hit. And I think that speaks to the fact that a lot of these streaming services, which started out by trying to appeal maybe to wealthy people on the coast, are now trying to speak to everyone. All right. Well, of course, we'll continue to follow as that develops. Um, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, thanks so much. We'll be all over Netflix's results next week. Coming up, we will take a look back at some of the biggest antitrust cases of all time as lawmakers continue to debate breaking up big tech. That's next. And Beyond Meat has been cut to neutral at Credit Suisse with a $123 price target. The analysts there saying a higher investment spend, warehousing and transportation costs will leave the company well below its original EBITDA margin targets for next. The next two years shares down more than 3%. This is Bloomberg. Multiple lawsuits now face some of the biggest tech giants in the U.S., which make up 22% of the S&P 500. But when it comes to captains of industry, government intervention is nothing new. Here's a look back at some of the biggest antitrust cases that shaped U.S. history. John D. Rockefeller was a young but enterprising businessman from a poor family who found his way into the Ohio oil business during the Civil War. By 1870, he and his partners had turned Standard Oil into the largest refinery business in Cleveland. Over the next few decades, that one oil company became an empire, controlling up to 95% of refining across America. Rockefeller combining producers, refineries, and marketers into a trust that by 1906 caught the scrutiny of the U.S. government. Regulators sued the Standard Oil Corporation under the Sherman Antitrust Act, Within five years, the firm was ordered to sell off its major holdings, 33 companies in all. The resulting companies have since been renamed, and you'll recognize some of their more recent monikers, including Exxon, Chevron, and British Petroleum. Breakups also shaped the telecom industry. In 1974, the U.S. sued to break up AT&T, calling for the divestment of its subsidiary, Western Electric. At the time, Ma Bell serviced up to 85% of U.S. telephone lines, while most of the telephone equipment used was produced by Western Electric. Rather than lose the antitrust case, AT&T proposed an alternative, a self-imposed breakup. The company officially broke up in 1984. The result? Seven independent regional holding companies, or Baby Bells, giving consumers access to more choices and lower prices for long-distance service and phones. Companies like Bell Atlantic, Bell South, and U.S. West emerged. Then there's the longest-running monopoly war in the history of the United States, the antitrust case against Microsoft. In 1998, the Department of Justice and Attorneys General of 20 different states sued Microsoft, claiming its bundling of programs like Internet Explorer into its Windows operating system was monopolistic. The government accused Microsoft of making it difficult for consumers to install competing software like Netscape on their computers. Microsoft lost the case, with the presiding judge ruling the company violated the Sherman Antitrust Act and calling for Microsoft to divide the company in half, the operating system on one side and the software arm on the other. 
Microsoft appealed the decision, and the court overturned the earlier judge's ruling, ultimately leading to a 2001 settlement between Microsoft and the DOJ. The company would not need to break up, but it would be required to share computing interfaces with other companies. Microsoft agreed to abide by a consent decree through 2011, barring it from entering into Windows agreements that excluded competitors from new PCs. The Justice Department says that agreement leveled the playing field, making way for the rise of Apple and Google, and now a new generation of tech titans. You can see more of that on our special show, Red Lines, U.S. and Big Tech. It's going to be playing throughout the weekend, starting tonight, 7 p.m. Wall Street time, 4 p.m. on the West Coast.